Welcome everybody to another great episode of Real Life Matters. Please subscribe to the channel uh, and, and and select the bell icon and just, you know, and support the guests that come on here today also because they need your support. And um, of course, I'm Big Boss. And anyways, I have somebody here that's very special. We know each other for a long time over uh, the social media. But anyways, with no other for, for you know, with no other ado, I'm going to introduce to you award-winning poetry slam champion and Scarborough Walk of Fame inductee. He's a writer, he's an artist, he's a speaker, and he's doing a, a little, uh, some movie here, a little production, and we're going to talk to him. So with no other further ado, I introduce to you Dwayne Morgan. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I tell you, it was a lot here, a lot of stuff you do there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's been a great life and a great career thus far. It's been a great, oh. So can you tell everybody where you come from and what's your background? All right, so I was born uh, in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, family from Jamaica. So I kind of, you know, I'm that first generation born outside of the island. So there's, you know, one foot in the old world and one foot you know, in, in, in this world. And, um, you know, I just kind of use all of that influence to, to create and to do all of the things I've been uh, doing with my life. So you've been to Jamaica? Many times. I try to go as often as possible. <laughs> Usually there at least once every two years, at least. Wow. Okay. Well, there's a lot to dissect with you because you're doing so many things. And okay. So tell us how, you know, what inspired you to become a poet? A poet. Uh, you know, it's it's really interesting and it's a bit of a funny story because it's not something that I ever wanted to do. Those people who know me uh, know I'm very much uh, a shy introvert. I don't like speaking in front of people. I don't like being the center of attention. However, that's what I've been called to do in life. So I've had to, you know, get over myself and kind of step into that. So um, this all started for me when I was in high school and I was the president of our Black students group. And I decided to put on a, a talent show. And I got all of my friends who had talent. And as we were getting closer to the talent show, I realized that everybody was going to come and watch all of my friends. And nobody would know that I put it all together. And I had to figure out, well, how can I get in the spotlight with everybody else? When you have no talent, what can you do in a talent show? So I said, all right, well, maybe I'll, I'll write a poem. Because I can't rap. I can't dance. I can't sing. But I said, you know, poem. You can't dance. Nah, well, no, not not in the way that would put me on stage as a dancer. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I said, all right, you know what? Let me let me try and write a poem. And I I, I wrote a poem, and and it went over well. And you know, it it changed everything that happened after that. Wow. So you said that you didn't you do, you didn't like to be in the spotlight, so you were shy. So what was it for your first moment when you went on when you went on stage and you had to, you know, how was that for you? Oh, it was absolutely terrifying. It was, um, you know, and I'm, and I'm still shy to this day, even though I've been doing it now almost 30 years. It's still it's just, you know, who I am. But, um, yeah, it was it was terrifying to just be up there in front of people. Everybody's kind of looking at you. You're trying to make sure that you remember, you know, the words of the poem and you don't mess it up and stuff. So. Um, definitely it, uh, it was, you know, baptism by fire, as they say, but you just kind of <laughs> jump in and, and start making your arms work and hope that you're swimming. Wow. So you write all your own stuff. Yes. So what inspires you to do, do um, what you do every day? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, uh, at this point in my career, um, I have my 14th book coming out next month in December. I have nine albums out. So, you know, I, I write and I create a lot. And, um, you know, I'm just inspired by being alive. I don't take it for granted that I'm alive. There's nothing that I have personally done to wake myself up any day. I have no idea why I wake up in the morning. God, the universe, whatever sees fit to wake me up. So the simple fact that I'm alive means I have work to do. And means every single day that I'm here on this side of life, I have to look for the stories. I have to try to find what are the things that matter. 
How can I, you know, inspire somebody else? What, you know, what, how can I be of service to, to humanity? So I think I'm constantly inspired just simply by being alive and being present and not taking anything for granted, whether it's the ability to travel, the ability to, you know, be in a school and talk to a young person, the, you know, ability to just go and meet other people. So all of it is special to me. And, and that is what inspires me on a daily basis. So is anybody else in your family do, did that, that you could say you drew that from or? Yeah. <laughs> I'm the I'm the only artistic one in the family, so I'm I'm the black sheep of the family. Nobody oh, has any kind of. There's some good sheep family. there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no one else has, that, has any art 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 talent. Okay, so this is what you do full time, or do you? Uh, this has been this has been my full time job ever since I was in high school. So uh, 28 years uh, running right now. We just we just crossed over 28 years. So in the industry, so who have you worked with? Um, so I mean the 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 act of creating and writing is something where for the most part it's you know solo that you kind of do it by yourself, but I've always taken a very creative approach to my career and it has allowed me to do things that a lot of people who are writers don't necessarily get to do because they may just think of themselves as, oh, I'm just a writer or I just write novels. But I've always seen myself as an entertainer who uses writing as their vehicle. So, you know, as a result of that, I've had the opportunity I've opened up for Alicia Keys. I've been on stage with Russell Peters, Cardinal Official. I've uh, worked with Drake. I've opened for Barack Obama. I've just been able to do- So how was that? Well, what did you do as part of Barack Obama? Um, I opened up for him. So he came to Toronto in 2020 before um, the epi uh, before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he was at the Metro Convention Center and I was one of his opening acts. So what, what did you what did you say there? What did you do? Uh, it was a poem called uh, Success Runs in My Race. And it was just looking at, um, you know, generation after generation, how we continue to um, to be successful despite all of the challenges and hurdles that uh, might be present in front of us. So can you give us a little sample of that, what you said? Um, Are you? On your mark, get set, and so it begins. On the dark continent of enlightenment, the place from where all history comes. A people who were so ahead of their time, they were sending text messages when they only had drums. Out of the starting blocks, we are off to an early lead as world travelers and explorers, sharing our philosophies, creating universities and structures that would make the world stop and wonder before passing the baton on to the relay's next runner in the Caribbean Sea. So that's just the beginning of- Wow! <laughs> I guess you didn't know you were gonna do that one today, but that's okay. Well, I, I had no idea, but good thing, good yeah, thing. Yeah, no idea, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Real life matters, people. The viewers went, "Hey, well, Zebra's how come we didn't ask him to say something?" And they and they 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 said comments to me. So, <laughs> all right, well, that's good. You covered that base, then. You covered that. <laughs> base. But they made that the full base, yeah. But anyways, <laughs> for how was it working with Alicia Keys? Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where you know when you're just opening up for somebody, we didn't even mm -hmm. get to meet. It's just like. Well, wow. here's your time. You go on stage, you do your thing, and she's there in her dressing well, room. She's with her passing, band, just whatever. passing. Yeah. And and so that's that's you know, so a lot of times people think that you know this stuff is so glamorous and stuff, but oftentimes you don't even get to meet the people. So I mean it was great with Obama that we actually get to got to meet. So him and I have a picture together and stuff like that. So that was you and know, you talk to him and everything. Yep. So that was that one wow. was real good. You know, me and him just kind of there. So that was awesome. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, with with a lot of other things, it's just, you know, everybody just kind of has their time and you just go do your thing and, and just keep it moving. <laughs> so, and, and you said you open up for somebody else. Um, uh, Russell said, Peters. Uh, yeah, I shared the stage with uh, with Russell Peters, Cardinal Official, Julie Black, stuff like that. And I mean, uh, before Russell really became an international, you know, hit, I mean, he was big throughout Toronto. And so there was lots of shows that we would both just be in. Um, now, not so much because he's a huge international star, but on the come up on the, you know, on the journey to getting to that place, then, you know, we did many shows together. So what did you do with Cardinal Official? 
Um, again, it's just being on stage, being in the same in the same shows and the same uh, performances. So you know, they book him, they book me. Um, same thing with with Julie Black and and all of us like Cardinal, um, Julie. So what Black. did you do? Did you do a Caribbean kind of um, a poetry, or what did you do there? No, I just stay. I just stay in my lane, and I just do my thing. Like I can't even remember exactly what poems I was I was performing, but <laughs> um, you know because this stuff has been forever, but we've all known each other since, since we were young, um, you know, since um, maybe late high school university time. So I met Cardinal mm -hmm. at York University. I met Julie Black around the same time as I was in university. Wait, Cardinal went to York University? He did go to U York University. Wow. So, um, so that is where, you know, we met and we all kind of came up at the same time, right? There's just this renaissance of, you know, young black artists. So, you know, Cardinal, Julie Black, Glenn Lewis, all of these people, we all kind of came up at the same time. And, you know, we were all just in our own lane doing our own thing. So when you get ready for wanting to do one of these shows, what do you do? Uh, well, I mean, the first thing is, you know, once I know how much time I have, I have to figure out, all right, what are the, what are the poems that I feel like sharing? What are the things that I want to speak about? Um, and then I think about uh, what is the experience that I want the audience to have. And, um, you know, because that also helps me to inform, you know, what poems I'm going to do and what order to put things in so that I can um, be very mindful of the emotional roller coaster that I bring the audience on during my performance. And then after mm -hmm. that, it's really just a matter of... Um, you know, rehearsing and, and practicing and trying to make sure that I have it down and I have it right and I know what's going to happen. Do you happen. stand in front of a mirror? Yep. In front <laughs> of the mirror for, for hours and the mirror is my audience and I just go and go and go and, and, and try to practice it, you know, try to say, hey, what if I said the poem this way or what if I change something at this part or, you know, you just, you just play with it. And, and a lot of times people say, Oh, it's poetry, so you just get up there and say the poem. But mm. I think a big part of my success is the fact that I actually rehearse, that I actually put a lot of time in that nobody sees and nobody knows about, so that when you actually see me on stage, it's uh, you know, I can shine brighter than many other people who just say, Oh, I'm just gonna share a poem. Well, well, they know now that you that you're putting the work in. <laughs> well, yes, yes, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt that you're putting the work behind because you know sometimes you just wonder that like, you just get up on stage and just go do that you know people like i know you have to prepare yourself mm -hmm. for you know when you're gonna do that so so did you take school for this or you just um i never went to school for it it was just something that just kind of came natural to me once i discovered that it existed. And once I discovered that I had talent, it just kind of um, came naturally, naturally to me. And I've, I've always been um, very self-reflective and, and, and self-critical. So I'm always asking, okay, what can I do better? How can I get better at this thing? You know, how can I do things differently? So I've never really been one who's been satisfied with where I'm at, because I always believe that, all right, now there's, what's the, what's the next level? What's the next thing to do, the next thing to try? And um, so, and I, and I think that allows me to, you know, to stay sharp, to stay relevant, to, um, you know, to craft stories that actually resonate with people. And um, yeah, so I think it's just really been something that has been innate within me that I didn't know that was, it was there. And, you know, through, um, through stepping into this arena, I've learned and discovered things about myself that maybe otherwise I'd never would have known about. It's like what? What did you discover about yourself? Um, we already know you're shy. <laughs> yeah, so there's there's that. But I mean, I think when I talk about discovering things about myself, it's like that, um, you know, you have thoughts that matter, that you have perspectives on the world that matter, that you have talent that matters. And I think, you know, especially when you're a shy, quiet person, one of the things that we often do is we say, well, I'm not going to speak up because nobody really cares what I have to say. And, and yeah, you know, what I say really doesn't matter. And we say those things to ourselves to justify not speaking. But once I started to speak, I realized, oh, you know what? The things that you're saying matter. People care about this. And it, it allowed me to, to really see 
that I had value as a human being. And, you know, that I was actually doing something and giving something of value to the world, to my community, to, you know, wherever I was. And I think those are the things that I've discovered about myself through, um, you know, stepping into this world. Wow. So you must have been good at English in your class and poetry writing and communications. Yeah, I was always good at English, but at the same time, I had no idea that I was good enough to do something with it. And, okay. you know, and, and I also didn't know what could I do with it because nobody thinks, oh, I'm going to go to school and, and study English. It's like, that doesn't even make sense. I don't even know what I would do. I didn't want to be an English teacher or Major. anything like that. So, you know, even when I went to York University, my degrees are in mass communications and sociology. I didn't do English. Oh. I didn't do performance. I didn't do any of that stuff. Um, this was always just something that was happening outside of education. And um, yeah, I think, um, you know, while I was great at English, I think that has helped me. I, I probably would have stopped doing this if I pursued English. I probably would have lost the love for it. Uh, so I think it's maybe a good thing that I didn't follow through and study English because then I would just be so immersed in that, that by this point, I'd, I'd probably be over it. So I think it's maybe a good thing I that I didn't so. go and study English. I don't think so. <laughs> this is your path. <laughs> I don't think you'd be over it, you know, but do you write this to do certain artists and different people since you do like spoken word, do they ask you to write stuff for them? Different um, yeah, I mean, there's been people it. that, uh, that I've worked with. There's, um, you know, people who ask me for help, like with songwriting, there's, um, people who want stuff, you know, for a video or for a movie or for a commercial or for, you know, whatever. And, you know, one of the things that I've discovered is that, you know, when you're good at, at writing and being able to tell stories, there are so many applications for that. So even though my main thing is, is poetry, just the ability to write and tell stories means I can do stuff in advertising and I can do stuff in film and I can do stuff with music. I don't have to stay limited in this box of, oh, you just write poetry. You just do, you're just the spoken word and that's it. Right. And, you know, we live in this world where a lot of times people want to put people just in these boxes. And I've always mm -hmm. tried my best to be outside of all of the boxes as possible because I understand how limiting that can be to how we see ourselves. So, you know, as, as much freedom as I have from those boxes, it really allows me to imagine and to, to create what it, whatever it is that I want to create. So how do you differentiate now? You, somebody asks you to write something for them. And then you might say, hmm, maybe I should use this for one of my, my poetry. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide like, oh my gosh, I don't think I'm going to use this one. I think I'm going to use this for myself. Right. Um, I mean, I, I luckily that hasn't happened too many times. Um, too many times, but, but it's happened. It's happened once or twice. But it really comes down to, are they paying? Because if they're oh. paying, then I can let it go, right? If they're paying, I'd be like, okay, you know what? I can part with this. If it's not a paid situation, then if I can use it for myself and probably make more money off of it, then I would use it for myself and I'd create something else for them. So I think it really, you know, as an artist, I've always been also very much into the business side of art. I think that's also why I've been able to have such a long career simply just doing poetry and, and writing because people ask me all the time, how on earth do you live for almost 30 years just off of poems? And I think, you know, from very early, I understood the importance of the business side. So, monetizing you know, monetizing it. Yeah, you have to be able to, to, to monetize and realize that your talent, your time has value. So I think, you know, in a situation like that where I'm creating something and I'm like, oh, this is really good. I could use this. It the deciding factor is, am I getting paid or, or not? And so kind of the fees, there. are the fees reasonable or depends, or you just have a standard fee or it depends if you have, to, so how do you, how do you go about like, you know, to tell people oh, this price for that? Um, I think that I try to negotiate with everybody. I don't have um, mm -hmm. set fees. I like to know um, what is it? What is the scope, you know, of it? Um, mm -hmm. because sometimes there are things that you can get that aren't necessarily monetary, right? And mm -hmm. sometimes it might be, you know, um, 
somebody showing a film and maybe you have a little commercial trailer in it or something. You know, oh, there's okay. all these different like things. A that, yeah, mm -hmm. that can happen, right? So it isn't always about, you know, dollars and cents, but it's like how many people are going to see this? What is the reach of it? You know, all of these kinds of things. And you factor all of that in. Um, you know, is this coming out of your pocket or is are there people financing, you know, this thing? And once you kind of have all of those factors, I like to just work with everybody on an individual basis and say, all right, this is what I think would be fair. And you can always come back to me and say, okay, can we do this or that? But yeah, it's definitely not a set fee. I try to work with everybody on an individual basis. Okay. Because you live off of this. This is what you do every day that you live off. So you obviously, it's, it's come to the point that Yes, I can live off of this. <laughs> you yeah, know and, what I mean? Yeah, and, and you know, and sometimes you know, people want you to feel guilty that you're charging for what you do. And I'm like, this, Excuse this, me? Is how, this is how my daughter eats. This is how my bills get paid. Like, like you you don't you get up live on air. Yeah, you don't get up in the morning and go to work and your boss says, Yeah, I'm not gonna pay you today. You would just go back home. <laughs> you go back, you would leave immediately. Yeah, but you, you feel no ways reaching out to me with this expectation that I should go to work for free. And no, that, that's just not how it's going to work. So, you know, I, I had to learn to value what it is that I do, value the talent that I have. And, you know, there's so many accolades in my bio and stuff that I've done that I know I deserve the money. I'm worth the money. So it's not even like, you know, I'm trying to be unfair and stuff. I'm very reasonable with everybody, but at the same time, there's no value in things that people get for free. So I have to make sure that I always remind myself that I am valuable. Yeah, you have value. Mm -hmm. And okay, so you've worked with, okay, so you go to, you go to the US or do you go to um, Europe and stuff? Have you been over there? Yep. So at this point, I've performed in 18 countries internationally. So I mean... Then Canada, the States, Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, Bermuda, England, Ireland, Scotland, Budapest, France, Germany, Spain, South Africa, Turkey, Ghana. So still looking to add some more places on there. So if you're so watching. which place did you like the best when you went? A couple, the three, top three. Well, I mean, I'm always partial to Jamaica so that. that ah! Okay, we will, we will exclude yeah. that one since yeah. you're from so, there. Take it from there, then it has to be somewhere between Ghana and South Africa. So somewhere. And what did you like about there? I mean, South Africa was cool because it was my first time in Africa. And that was my first wow. time touching down on the continent of Africa. And I actually brought um, a group of people from Toronto with me. I actually just put it out on Facebook and said, hey, I'm planning to go to South Africa. Does anybody want to come? And Does anybody want to come? You just... Well, they had to pay their way to get there. Of course. I, well, well, obviously. And I had a, like a, a tour operator who was going to be a part of it. So I said, I'm going to go for, for two weeks. We're going to do a week in uh, Johannesburg, a week in Cape Town. And does anybody want to come? And 14 people signed up and said that they're going to wow. come. Wow. So we went for two weeks, and it was absolutely uh, amazing, an amazing time. And we, we filmed the documentary um, called... Um, my goodness, it slips me at the moment. But a gentleman oh. by the name of uh, <laughs> it's called Memento. It's called uh, Memento. And, Memento. Uh, Memento. I was like, yeah. well, geez, you went down there. I guess you were so <laughs> overtaken with all everything that off. Oh. Right, but yeah. So just in the last year or so, it's been in uh, in a number of uh, film festivals and stuff like that. Uh, and it was just looking at that trip that we did to you know to South Africa and, and so many people who were just touching down in Africa for the first time. And then, um, so what Ghana. was the momento about that? That 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 um, uh, that you did when you filmed down there, the documentary. Uh, yeah, so th it was just really just documenting what it was like for um, you know people who have never been to Africa to actually go oh. to Africa, and it just okay. looked at all the stuff that we did over the over the two weeks, and and you know the things we learned and conversations that we had with people to learn, you know more about how the people live, um, you know, and, and kind of compare that with what we thought and, and how we lived. And then uh, when I went to Ghana, mm -hmm. Ghana is the only country that I've ever been to that, you know, I, as soon as I walked out of the airport, it felt like I'd been there before, even though I wow. knew 
it was my first time there. And it's the only place, you know, I've been to that felt almost identical to Jamaica. And, you know, we spoke about it before, and I've been to Jamaica so many times that nowhere else, like even when I go to Trinidad, Trinidad feels nothing like Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Gone, no. Feels like Jamaica. So, mm -hmm. you know, when people talk about, you know, a lot of the slave trade and, and a lot of people who ended up in Jamaica probably coming from Ghana, it makes a lot of sense because, you know, people would just look at me and, and, and speak to me in their native tongue. And I'm like, hey, I'm not even from here. <laughs> I look like I'm there. Right. And, and it's the same kind of vibe as that you would see in Jamaica. Everything is like so identical to how you would experience it in Jamaica. So it was a real uh, surreal experience being there in Ghana and, and 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 going through that. Wow. So how do you feel about, you know, you're you you keep winning all these poetry slam champions. How did you feel with that? I mean, the it, it's great to win. I mean, I've I've lost more than I won, and I think that's always the thing that's that's really important. Um, you know, especially you know, I do a lot of work with young people and stuff, and and people always harp on the fact that I've won, but I always tell them how many times I've lost. I think you know, for the national championship, I think I came in second place maybe five times, and I've won it twice. Um, and I think, you know, that's all part of the journey, though. You don't appreciate the winning without losing, without the bitterness of of loss, without getting so close and not getting there. You know, that's what drives you to keep trying to get, you know, better and improve and, and that sort of thing. So I think, um, you know, winning that on, on multiple occasions has been, um, you know, a great experience for me um, because it really you know, forces me to to kind of dig deep in terms of what do I want to say and really pay attention to, you know, my how I'm using words and how I'm using ideas and images and how I'm performing to, you know, to try to get the best possible results. So I think it's definitely a blessing. It's not lost on me that I've had these successes, but, you know, all of those successes um, are valuable because of how many times I've lost. Right. And so what about the Scarborough? You're, you're becoming a inductee for the Scarborough Walk of Fame, you know. That that was another one that was that was pretty <laughs> surreal. Uh, I, I couldn't even, you know, believe it when it was happening. And, um, you know, that was back even hard to believe that was 2013. And it still feels like, you know, yesterday when when that happened. And, you know, growing up in in Scarborough, there weren't really a lot of outlets. For, for me to get on stage, for me to perform my work. So to have the city recognize me for my efforts and recognize the things that I had done to try to create space, to try to promote the arts, to try to inspire young people was um, such a humbling experience. And now, you know, when I go, the, the, the Walk of Fame is inside the Scarborough Town Center shopping mall. And now when I go there, and even when I go there with my daughter, there's a star in the ground that has my name on it. So even when you talk about, you know, legacy and, and you know, even when I pass away physically, that star is still going to be there. People are going to wow. be like, who, who was this Dwayne Morgan guy? And they can go and they can look it up. Um, so it, it really was a reminder of the fact that the work that I do has value. And even when I don't see it, there's people who are watching it and extracting value from it. Because sometimes, you know, we don't know if what we do matters to anybody. We're just kind of here doing all of this stuff. And then the odd time, an accolade might come or someone might send you an email or, you know, somebody might leave a comment on, on one of your episodes. And that one comment makes your entire day. It makes you say, you know what? I'm actually doing something good here and I need to keep doing it. Because while I might feel bad, this person, it means the world to them. And you just keep going and moving forward. And I think... It's such a great reminder um, to me of how important the work that I do is. Right. So you producing and writing mm -hmm. When Brothers Speak. Mm -hmm. How would you come up with that? All right. So When Brothers Speak is a show that I've been producing now for 22 years. So this is the, the 22nd edition of this show. The 22nd edition? Yep. I've been, I've been doing this for, for a minute since 1999. And so to give you the backstory of how it all yes, happened. Yes, I want to hear it. 
is that um, I received an email about a poetry slam competition that was going on in Philadelphia. And this was probably back in 1998. And at the time, I had no idea what a poetry slam competition was. And I've always been a very curious person. So I decided I was going to drive to Philadelphia to find out. So I suppose I could have responded back to the email and said, hey, what is this? How does it work? But I wanted to go and see it for myself. So I borrowed my mom's car because at that time, I think I was just out of high school. I didn't even have my own car or nothing. Drove to Philadelphia and I saw so many amazing artists. And wow. I was like, wow, people in Toronto have no idea that this even exists. So then when I came back, I said to myself, well, how can I get some of these people here? So I decided to create a show called When Brothers Speak that would have black men from Canada and the USA perform together so that people could hear about the experiences of black men from black men. So in 1999, I did the first one, 400 people showed up. And I was like, 400 wow. people? Yeah, 400 people came out to listen to poetry. So what did you, and, where did you have it at? A, a, a club or, or some yeah, kind of place? it was in a club called the Comfort Zone at the corner of Spadina and, and College Street in Toronto. Oh. And then over the years, it grew to the point that we were hosting the show at the St. Lawrence Center for the Arts at the 500 seat theater. And we would sell out the theater every year. There was there were years where we had to do two nights that we would sell out the first night and had to add a second show because that many and people. How much did the charge? It was a mission. They're going there. Um, like I mean, it it ranges from anywhere between like twenty five and sixty dollars, depending, depending on where, where you're seated, where you're going to yeah. be seated. Okay. Yeah, depending on where people sat. So it became one of those things where you know. People, especially in the black community, they look forward to it every year. The the ladies went and got their hair done. The you know uh -uh. the book clubs came out. The guys dressed up. Everything you know, it was like date night kind of kind of vibe. And then when COVID hit, we had to switch it up a bit because we couldn't do it in person. So this is the second year that we've had to do the show uh, virtually. Okay. Uh, so it 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 kind of sucks that we're not in the theater. But the good part is, I mean, you were telling me that. You know, your show is, is viewed in 22 different countries. Mm -hmm. And the beauty is, no matter where people are, as long as they have the internet, they can buy a ticket and they can watch the show because okay. it's going to be streamed over the internet, right? So um, the beauty of it and now... And you can tag my page too on it. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so people so, can see, get your ticket and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the tickets are selling. We, I mean, the show is November 27th, so it's coming up uh, real quick. We have, a, a, you know, another... Jeez, that's next week, is it? Next yeah, week? Another eight days or so. We got um, Ontario's first Poet Laureate, Randella J, who's going to be performing on that. I'm performing on that. We have a brother named Patrick Walters. He's originally from St. Kitts, but he lives in Toronto now. He's performing. Uh, a brother from Hamilton called uh, uh, Eddie Lardy, who's performing. A brother from Las Vegas uh, called Obi West, who's going to be performing. And mm -hmm. it's all about listening to Black men speak about whatever they want to share. And I think so. Do you have a theme, or not really a theme? They just can talk about whatever. They, they, all of it is through poetry. So it all uh -huh. has to yeah, be done through, poetry, through yeah. poetry. But there is no theme other than these are the thoughts of black men, and that is the main theme. So people come, and you know, a lot of times they say, "Well, you know, we don't really hear from black men. We hear from black women all the time, but the black men are silent." <laughs> I don't, maybe not. I think men are speaking up a little bit more. I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> you don't hear from black men. You hear from go on Facebook. You gonna hear from them all. <laughs> so you know. So this is the show where you know people know. All right, I'm just gonna come here and I'm gonna listen to what these guys have to say. And um, yeah, you know what? I am blessed that for 22 years people have been supporting so how this. How long is the uh, show event. for? Two hours? Yeah, it's about a two-hour show that uh, that we put on okay. every year. So. You already have your theme set up. What you're going to speak and, uh, and talk about? Probably. Yeah, every, everything is everything is set, done, ready to go. So you know, it's um, it's um, 
you know, for me, I'm the only artist who who performs in it every year because, well, it's my show. So that's it's one your of the show, obviously. That I get, right? So, you know, so every year I try to like debut some stuff that people haven't heard before. So, you know, it's, it's always, it's always great and always a challenge because, you know, I'm busy trying to produce the show, but then I'm still trying to learn new material and write new material and stuff like that. So, uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's, it, you're just grateful that, that people want to, to listen and, and people see the value in what it is that you're doing and, and what it is that you're offering to people. So what putting a show like that together, what's until, do you have artists that are singing? I know it's everybody's doing, men are doing poetry, but do you have other acts other than that? Or is it just completely just poetry? It is that's, all, that's it. 100% poetry. We do not add wow. anything to it. It is poetry raw, by, by black men, raw, uncensored, period. The end. So, you know, we don't, we don't try to confuse it. We don't try to, you know, add a whole bunch of other things to it. We want people to know this is exactly what it is. Black men speaking, the end. And that's all the you're going to get. The only thing is that you give the artists a certain amount of time. Yes. Yeah, so every artist, each artist has 20 minutes. So and in that 20 minutes, you talk about whatever you want to talk about in your time. And you wear what you had to wear and that's it. That is it. Yep. Totally raw, uncensored. <laughs> I don't know what people are going to talk about, but you oh, have Oh, you don't time. know? You just tell them that you're giving them 20 minutes and that they don't have yes. to send something in? They don't know. No, no, no. It's like I, I handpick all the artists based on who they are, mm -hmm. based on my knowledge of their work, but then they get to choose what am I going to do with my 20 minutes? What am I going to mm -hmm. speak about? So they don't have to share that with me, but so when I speak about it being raw and uncensored, it's raw and uncensored because I don't know either what they're going to talk about. But what what you know, happens if people go over their time? Do you kind of poke them off? Yes, that has <laughs> happened on several occasions. <laughs> uh, Look, because, it's your time to come off now. Yeah, because you know what? It's one of those things where you know I always talk to artists before the show, and I said uh -huh. reminder, you know, and everybody gets the reminders. This is how much time you have. This is how much time you have. So to me, when you go over the time, it's like a disrespectful thing to me and a disrespectful yeah. thing to the other artists on the show because you know when we were doing the show in the theater. We had to be done at a certain time because, you know, everybody's there is getting paid. And I'm like, when somebody decides to go start going over time, I'm just like, Bridget, like, what is happening here? This is timed out in such a way that we get done the show at a certain time. This is the professional way to do it. You know, if you're loving the crowd, win them over and then leave and them. And then come off. off. <laughs> yeah. Leave them <laughs> and, off and come off. Do your time come off because then what happens is that the person at the end sometimes has to shorten their time just to make sure that we can get done on time and that's not fair to that other mm -hmm. artist because you decided you want well that's to a good set of time that you gave them though 20 minutes well yeah 20 minutes is a fair amount of time to, that's you know, a good it's not like it's 10 minutes or something and your work and stuff so yeah so there have definitely been times where i had to come in and pull people off the show i never <laughs> liked to do it so what do you do you just walk up to them and tap their shoulders like hey <laughs> usually yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> or you so, have a poker stick. Well, you know what? I don't like to do it because it's it's embarrassing. I know, me, I know, you know, but you know, but people I, sometimes some people just don't get it though, you know. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's like, well, I, I have no choice here. I have to do it. <laughs> you've you've made me do this because you knew how much time you had and you've gone over it. So yeah, it's it's not something that I like to do, but I've definitely had to do it on occasion. <laughs> But that's a part of producing, you know what I mean? That the people, you know, you, you got to be the good cop, bad cop, you mm -hmm. know, time, 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 time. <laughs> well, I mean, the, one of the other things that I that I started to do, which also works, is the, you know, the contract that I have with the artist is for 20 minutes. And then I right. put in the contract that the amount that you are getting paid decreases after 20 minutes. Now, when you start hitting people in the wallet, they're like, oh, 19 minutes. Oh, All right. Oh, oh, hold on. Yeah, I'm good. Hold on. My money's going down. Exactly. So when they realize that in this contract, it says you get this amount for 20 minutes or less, 
Now you start getting less once you go over 20 minutes. Most people suddenly find a way to regulate themselves and well, make sure that they don't That's a smart thing to put in that contract. Maybe some people should put that in. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Well, I've been doing these works. 22 shows and 21 shows. You, <laughs> you got to know, you know. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. You, you oh, learn as my, you go. My money will be deducted. <laughs> Dwayne Morgan said, you will get deducted if you go over 20 minutes. Hear me? And I don't want to hear nothing. Oh, and it's in it's in the paper. Yeah, and, it, and it's funny because, you know, I've been at things and I hear, you know, poets laugh and they're just like, oh, you got to talk to Dwayne because Dwayne is like, straight, like, I have the reputation that everybody knows now. Do not mess around in any of my shows because it you will get docked money, stuff like, I take this stuff very serious so you know i have that reputation in the world of of poetry now <laughs> well i guess you would <laughs> yeah so so what would you advise somebody if they wanted to come in the industry that you're in um i think the first thing you have to do is is find your voice and find the things that you're passionate about the things that you want to talk about a lot of times you know people might listen to my work or they see a bunch of stuff on YouTube and they say, oh, I like that. And they watch it so many times that when they start to write, everything that they write sounds like this thing that they've been watching. And I think it's really important to just find your own voice, find your own Be flair. authentic. Yes, your authenticity, what makes you unique. Um, and that's the starting point. And then from there, it's to fall in love with learning. How much can I learn about this thing that I'm doing? And once you fall in love with the learning, then the next thing I always say to people is then ask yourself, what can I give to it? Because a lot of times we get into things for what we can get from it. But you also want to make sure that you're giving something to it because all of these things that we do are going to outlive us. When I'm no longer here, people are still going to be writing poems. But what did I do to make it easier for that next generation that's coming after me? What did I give to it? So as much as I've received... I always want to make sure that I'm also giving so that other people have a, an easier goal than I had. And you got to know the difference between a poet, a poetry and writing. Yes, absolutely. So, you, you know, you have to learn your craft. And, and that's where I say <laughs> fall in love with, with learning because you really have to learn what it is that you're doing and what you're involved with. And the spoken word, you know, how to formulate your sentences. So you still got to take some kind of... Uh, english language or you know to know to know that you know literature part of it because mm -hmm. if you if you can't write then how are you going to expect to 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 relate that on stage yes absolutely so what more can we expect from Dwayne coming forward um you know i'm i'm always working on some stuff so i mean like i said i have my my next book comes out on um in december so that's going to be available for, you know, Christmas, Kwanzaa, whatever people might want. You can give the gift of poetry. What's the book called? It's called All That Remains. And this is a, it's a collection of poems written in 2020 about all the things that we saw going on in the world, whether it's social justice, what? whether it's the pandemic, you know, if people went through breakups, you know, how, how difficult it was to have be in a relationship, you know, with social distancing and how many people broke up and, and all sorts of stuff. So all the stuff that went on in 2020. So it's called all that remains. And, and it's so just people broke up during, during the, um, the pandemic for a relationship. Oh yeah. There's lots of people who broke up because oh. you know, they couldn't see each other. Um, you know, there was oh, okay. Cause it can't okay. instant stuff. There was, there was people who broke up because they saw each other too much and, and, you know, <laughs> They, they they couldn't get enough personal space because they were just stuck with this person because they're working from home and you're working from home and there's no there's no way to escape this person who's just around you all the time. So, you know, there's all sorts of things that, that happen that people experience. So um, that book is just kind of, you know, reflecting on a lot of that. Um, I also do uh, a show called When Sisters Speak. So next March... It'll be the 21st year for the women's show. And it's very similar to what I do with the men, but that's all women. So well, you had to do the women's show because probably people probably heckled you about that and said, hey. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, make, <laughs> we make sure. What's that about? Yeah, create the one for the ladies. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I'm still just constantly writing and creating and, and trying to do as much as possible. So I'm I'm always working. I'm always, I always got stuff 
on the go. So there's, oh. there's always something coming. Well, we'll look forward for that book. So you, you're, is the book out or is this coming out next month? It's coming out next month. So, okay. um, you know, if people, uh, they could go to my website, DwayneMorgan.ca or on my Instagram, uh, Dwayne underscore Morgan, and they can just find out more information on, on how they can get in. Oh, do you have any shout outs that you want to give anybody? Uh, well, shout out to you for um, having me on. Shout out to um, all of your listeners. And um, yeah, I hope, you know, feel free to get in touch with me if you want to find out about the show. As I said, through my website or Instagram, you can find the link to get tickets to the show. Uh, as well, my my publicist, Sasha Stoltz, for, um, you know, all the work she's doing behind the scenes to help get the word out um, to the show. So, yeah, I mean, that's it for, you know, shout outs. But definitely Thank you. It's been a long time coming, so I appreciate the opportunity. I know. First to and get to the and chat. When, so, um, where are you going to be doing? I know it's a virtual show, so where are you going to be filming the show from? So we we have a studio downtown Toronto that we uh, will be doing the show from. Okay. And we okay. we shoot there. So once people buy the tickets, um, once eight o'clock comes on November twenty seventh, there's a thing on the ticket that just says "Press here to watch," and you just press, and it brings you right. To the link. Okay. And so the artists right are on. actually, so all the artists and people are coming to that studio to actually do it there. Yeah. The only, oh, okay. the only so exception is the, in or something. Okay. Yeah. The only exception is the, is the gentleman from, from Las Vegas because it's okay. just going to be okay. too much. It's stuff. too much. It's a lot of protocol for him probably, yeah. you know, to yeah, get yeah, over yeah. here. So. so, so everybody else will be live from the studio. <laughs> well, we can't wait to get your book. And you don't have a copy of it there or nothing? I don't. I haven't even seen uh, a copy of it yet. So we, I don't even have a a, a proof of it. A yet proof. Here. Okay. Yeah, so I don't have the proof. Well, they better of it hurry yet. up. We've got to come out for. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't worry. We're we're on it. We're on it. I'm, oh I'm, I'm, I'm calling my guy tomorrow just to check on the progress. So you know, so we're on it. So Dwayne, if people want to find you, um, they can. You, you just mentioned. Can you just tell them your social medias again. Yeah, so again, it is uh, DwayneMorgan.ca, D-W-A-Y-N-E-M-O-R-G-A-N. And then on Instagram or Twitter, it's Dwayne underscore Morgan. So D-W-A-Y-N-E underscore M-O-R-G-A-N. You can find me on there and any of those places, it has um, all of my links. So you can, or you know what, just put my name in, in Google or whatever and everything comes up. YouTube, this, that, Spotify, whatever. Do you answer? Do you answer your people? This will question. <laughs> yes, yes. And I, I respond oh, okay. to all of the emails. The only thing is, I'm I'm rarely on Facebook now, so I always tell yeah. people don't don't message me on Facebook because I'm very rarely there. But Twitter, I'm on there, but some people do, and that's not a good thing. I tell them to either send me a direct email that way I know you're serious, or ain't some somebody yeah. trying to, whatever. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, email, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. I'm I'm there more often. So that, okay. those are always the best ways to reach me. All right. Well, Dwayne, it's been a pleasure. Oh my gosh, you, you got everything out. You you didn't expect to get all your stuff out, but you did. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> we don't really rush in, rush in. No, because yep. we want to get to know who you who you are. You know, it's not, you Absolutely. know, it's not this rush thing. I can't I can't understand who you are or where you what you're doing. And then everybody's like, oh, she should ask this, she should ask that. But we did ask everything. Right. <laughs> All right. So everybody, I do want to thank you again. I do all want to thank the viewers tonight for um, you know, watching. Please go support uh, you know, Dwayne with the um spoken brother, spoken word. That's right. When brothers speak, yep. Yeah, when brothers speak, spoken word. Yeah, when brothers speak. And, um, you know, like, you know, just support that, you know, get your tickets, get your tickets because it's something to see, you know. So this guy is just not somebody just doing it. He's been doing it a long, many decades. So, you know, you got you to gotta give kudos to where it gives. So anyways, I do want to thank everybody tonight. So bye for now, everyone. Take care.